Earlier this month, we learned that Binance led a $150 million fundraising round to reimburse victims of the largest DeFi hack in history. Well, imagine learning the hacker is North Korea. And what happened next? Uh, that's what happened to our next guest, Tigran Gambarian, Vice President of Global Intelligence and Investigations at the world's largest crypto exchange, Binance. Welcome, Tigran. Thanks for joining us. So the FBI has identified North Korean elite hacking group Lazarus as behind the 625 million Axie Infinity linked Ronin hack. And you've been tracking this hack. So from the moment it happened to now, do you ever think that it would be a nation state that was on the attack? Um, well, thank, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, so just to kind of give you a background where I come from, I spent over 10 years as a special agent with the Treasury, primarily investigating cryptocurrency before I moved to Binance. So um, I had a pretty good experience dealing with uh, with some of these actors because some of the cases that I worked initially included the Mt. Gox hacks. And so I've been involved in, in these investigations, including kind of the, the initial DPRK hacks. That was the initial... I guess the attacks that happened against the exchanges. So I had a pretty good understanding of how they operate and kind of the methods that they use. So I wasn't too surprised. I think this is kind of their MO is targeting large exchanges and kind of cryptocurrency uh, in general, so. Mm -hmm. And so what was Binance's role in all of this? So in this specific investigation, um, I think there's initial uh, requests that came in from law enforcement, which of course we cooperated with. I think that was our goal is to provide any of these that we could. Our team, which comprises experts in the industry, um, worked together with law enforcement to provide whatever information that we could in order to assist their investigation. So Tigran, uh, Binance, you're at Binance itself, not Binance yeah. US. So how much uh, support are you providing Binance US in terms of countering cybercrime uh, such as this, uh, particularly because uh, it, it's a concern of our viewers who, who can only in, uh, trade through Binance US, first of all, but second of all, uh, considering North Korea is uh, basically a foe of the United States and, and uh, there's the potential that, uh, that, that Binance US customers would possibly be targeted at the very least. So what kind of support are you providing at Binance.com, if you will, uh, and how integrated is it? Sure. So Binance US is a completely separate investigations team, kind of compliance teams. Uh, I'm on a dot .com site. So other than information and intelligence sharing, uh, there's not much else going on there. But again, Binance US is part of the larger cryptocurrency community, and they do receive kind of the information from the industry and both law enforcement. And they also have their own very good security team that, you know, where that prevents these kinds of attacks. And again, um, what happened to a rodent attack was not necessarily a actual technical breach, but it was actually a human element that was involved. This includes all the previous attacks by DPRK or North Korea against cryptocurrency exchanges. So it's really, it's not really a security, but it's a human element that actually initiated the, uh, the compromise. So this all raises a much larger question, which is how traceable is, you know, blockchain technology, right? This has become a really big debate in, in, in Washington. Um, so, you know, with the North Korea hack, for example, um, you know, how easy was it to actually, like, figure out who the culprit was? And what is the likelihood of actually recovering these funds? So I guess you have to separate them out, right? How is it easy to find it and how easy to recover it? So as far as finding it... Um, I think cryptocurrency provides a great method for investigators and for compliance uh, professionals to actually track these funds. And I think it provides a lot more transparency than kind of the, the legacy financial system as far as investigators' ability to, to trace where the illicit funds are going. Um, I myself have worked cryptocurrency cases going back to the early 2010s. I worked the very first investigation and involved. Cryptocurrency tracing, which is the uh, the Silk Road agents, or the I guess the corruption Silk Road corruption case, and that was the first time that actually law enforcement was able to leverage cryptocurrency in the blockchain to identify illicit activity. So that kind of opened up the Pandora's box for law enforcement in general, and then and really it was a showcase for that cryptocurrency is transparent, you can trace it. And a lot of the cases, if cryptocurrency was not used, a lot of these bad guys would not be identified. So. Uh, there's definitely the ability for us to use 
uh, cryptocurrency to identify uh, these illicit funds, right? And then in the example, as far as recovery of it, uh, so I'll give you a good example. So uh, one of the cases I was involved in was the seizure of 69,370 Bitcoin that was stolen from Silk Road, you know, back in or, you know, early 2010s. So those funds I had uh, identified and traced and were able to recover that in 2020. So there's definitely a way to recover these funds. Now, in this specific case, in the Ronin hack, that all depends on the investigators and where the funds eventually end up. Uh, but if they end up in an ES and exchange or if law enforcement able to get their hands on the actual funds, it's definitely recoverable. It just depends on how quickly the investigators act in this and if it ends up in actual jurisdictions where law enforcement is able to get their hands on it. So somewhat relatedly, another big topic has been, you know, the potential use of crypto by Russians to avoid sanctions. And, you know, Binance is one of the exchanges that is still accepting rubles. Um, can you just weigh in on that? Like how how is because there's a lot of debate about this, right? Um, how big a threat is this, this idea that, you know, Russians could use crypto to get around sanctions by, by the West? Is there any evidence of that or is this threat just kind of being overblown by lawmakers all over the world? I believe some of it comes from not understanding cryptocurrency and kind of understanding the liquidity that there's there and how sanction ev ev evasion usually works. I think, as you guys know, being part of Coindesk, uh, I guess cryptocurrency has always been kind of the, uses a little bit of the scapegoat to kind of uh, blame it for things that are happening. And I think in least in this case, I think the use of cryptocurrency to evade sanction is kind of blown out of proportion. Uh, nothing that I'm seeing suggests that it's being used on a large scale to evade cryptocurrency or to evade sanctions. And I think it's just a terrible mechanism for sanction evasion, just how much transparency is provided on these transactions. Um, just to give an example, any large transaction, people are usually talking about it uh, online. For So when I mentioned the 69,000 Bitcoin that, that, that had seized, uh, the moment that I'd moved the funds, the Twi you know, Reddit, you know, Twitter was blown up, you know, people are talking about how DPR is moving the funds again, but it was really just us moving the funds and really, the transparency that's there shows that on a large scale, cryptocurrency is terrible for sanction evasion. That is just not that's not the case. And also, uh, the other part of it is that you know, compliant KYC exchanges like Binance have the ability to identify individuals who are using these accounts if they are using them and actually get rid of them and get them off their systems. So, I don't think cryptocurrency so, uh, is a good mechanism for sanction evasion. Uh, just quickly I'll, I'll, on the so Russia I, question, I, have you, I mean, speaking from Binance's experience, um, have you, has Binance seen anything on that front? Because again, Binance is one of the exchanges that does accept rubles that is still working with Russia to a certain degree. Um, is there anything you could tell us just about Binance's experience with Russian users that would be somewhat illuminating on this, on this front? Because I think that would sort of help educate the public on how crypto is being used. Sure. Um, so as far as our sanctions, we're fully compliant with all the sanctions that are existing as they are. Again, the sanctions that are put into place are not comprehensive. They're targeted. Uh, and then, as you know, in public, both Coinbase and Kraken and Binance have taken a stance of not completely eliminating Russian user base because we think that actually goes against the spirit of cryptocurrency. As far as our ability to restrict you know, or, or to comply with sanctions, I think we're very well suited or we have the tools the people in place to actually comply with the sanctions as they are implemented today. So, I, I mean, just help me out here, because it, if I'm a Russian user or, or uh, you know, I can open an account in Russia, correct, using rubles right now on Binance. Is that, but is again, that I think correct? the ruble pairing, I it would have to get, I have to get back to you with it, but I'm not sure it's that easy. I mean, the, the banks, or the, the fiat channel, the banks themselves that are sanctioned are not interacting with Binance. So, I think it's all actually only crypto to crypto. I don't believe that the ruble pair is actually enabled. Okay, yeah, because I because my question was if I can open an account using rubles or or funding it with rubles, uh, potentially I can get it from my friend who might own a, a yacht full of uh, rubles and cash and just like you know hands it to me and You're it's like just gonna you know, have to get it. You're just gonna have to get a thousand more friends to really <laughs> clear the money that you're talking about. Like I you know, say, you can get a lot of friends with a yacht. I, you know, like you can really have a lot of friends with a yacht. When you have like a yacht, you all of a sudden they just show up, and then like you know, you just hand them. Like, we could stay friends if you just open up your account on Binance. Um, 
So, you know, I guess that's my question is how much KYC is involved here, uh, even with Russian users. I mean, you know, not everybody in Russia is, has those friends with the odds, but I'm sure there are quite a few who do. Um, so, how you know, have you stepped up uh, KYC enforcement in Russia or for Russian users? Absolutely. I think our KYC has been stepped up for users just all over the world. It's the same. We don't have, you know, we, we do have implemented certain I guess, methods of, of identifying sanction evasions, particularly in Russia. But I think our KYC is pretty robust uh, all across the platform. So it's not, you know, we're not having specially strict sanction, you know, KYC in Russia. We have strict KYC everywhere. So as far uh, just as wanna... their ability to use mules to evade sanctions, um, again, I don't think that's a very good way and very fast way of actually, that. there's a lot better ways to actually evade sanctions than uh, than having to use mules on cryptocurrency exchanges. And it's something that I haven't seen. In, in I just want to go back to uh, North Korea for a bit. Sure. So, so before we learned who the hacker wolves were, um, you guys led a 150 million raise to help out the victims of the hack. So I wonder why did Binance take a lead in that fundraising round and it does this set a precedent for future hacks i think that binance believes that it's important to work together and i think it's good for the binance does a lot of things that's not just good for binance but it's actually good for the entire ecosystem or the cryptocurrency industry as a whole and i think that's the approach that we took and i think i've seen a lot of times where uh exchanges were hacked by north korea but they were able to recover so i don't think that this is something that you say, okay, well, that's it. Ronan's hacked, Axel's gone. So I think that the approach that Binance took was to actually support the industry. And I think it's important for more exchanges to step up and actually, if they believe in a project, to kind of, you know, put their money where the mouth is. Yeah. From my understanding, North Korea is also specifically targeting large holders of crypto exchanges. So I wonder if... Uh, are folks underestimating them at all? I'm not sure, sure if they're underestimating them. I think they're just not being careful. Again, when, when, when these incidents are happening, and I've seen this time and time again, they're actually targeting employees, individuals within these companies. It's not like North Korea is actually breaking through their servers. They're actually targeting humans, and they're able to use these individuals within these companies to dump, I guess, Trojanized software on their networks. And in this case, it's exactly what happened. They're able to compromise the validators on the Rona network. And then that, that's what enabled to actually pull off this hack. So I think it's really down to, you know, training employees, really having your, you know, security teams in place to deal with these issues.